last week we explored with Chris and Stephen the first issue of the Leading Excellence book. This week we're going to go deeper into Leading Excellence, exploring more topics of this book focused on helping organisations create cultures of continuous improvement and innovation. Without further ado, let's get to the episode. Welcome to the Enterprise Excellence Podcast, where we aim to help create a better future. Learn from our world's experts how to improve and create enduring, high-performance, low-impact enterprises. Learn how to enhance morale, customer and purpose centricity, focus and calmness. Learn how to create and sustain a culture of excellence at all levels of your organisation. Welcome to episode 180 of the Enterprise Excellence Podcast. I have today Chris Dargs back on the show with us to talk about the second part of the Leading Excellence book which Chris and Dargs put so much effort into researching and writing to truly give us this new place of ideas and thought around the part leaders play to creating cultures of continuous improvement and excellence. Chris, Stephen, thank you so much for coming back on the show again today. You're welcome, brother. It's a real pleasure to be back. Yeah, appreciate it. So, guys, in the last episode, we spoke about the low employee engagement levels at work globally. We spoke about this critical aspect being basically leadership behavior and what people experience from their direct leader driving a big part of it. Spoke about leaders who serve and serve the growth of others and help others become the best they can. And the concept that to do that, you've got to be an adaptive leader because everyone's different and the context surrounding them can be different. And you kindly took us through the five hats of the adaptive leader. These five leadership skills and behavior that you guys found through your research and all the years of work you've done that are really the key hats that an adaptive leader needs to be able to wear. And Chris, you made a great point that in the one conversation, they may need to put on three different hats in just in that one piece. But we're going to go today, we're going to delve deeper into culture and a lot of the human behavior side of things. I just want to start off with yourself, Chris. In the book, where we talk about a leader and how does a leader stay in thought, but also how do they lead culture? You mentioned this core belief system. Do you mind explaining what a core belief system is and how you came about with it? Sure. We, 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 we did kick this around for a lot and went through several iterations. We also had a lot of help from, from Dr. Mark Williams, who, who authored the, the connected species, who, who, who's kindly written a forward for the book. And, um, I think the best way I try and explain it is that you know, I, I, human beings, we, we are first and foremost have the we we are feeling beings. Okay, so we are feeling beings who have the ability to think, but our in the most of the time our initial reaction is based on our feelings and our emotions, and and it's really helpful to understand that. Some people are better at it than others. Some people, like myself, really struggle with it. And, and our initial reaction to everything is emotionally. Um, and and so what we what we thought about was how do we kind of do it? What 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 can we do to make that easier for people? So we, there's a whole sec- a section in the book about how to understand your core belief system and how to build it. And, and you know, for me personally, I realized it's very much based based around some core values of, of respect and, and humility and trust and, and and really thinking about those deeply and what and, and what they mean and, and and really connecting it to well how does that help with my personal purpose because my, 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 my personal purpose is, is is to help people realize their full potential and help organizations to realize their people's full potential so so um Establishing that grounds you, I think, is a nice way to think about it. It grounds you in what is my, what are my core beliefs, um, and then we need something that helps us to pause between the emotional response and the thinking response, and that's where the hats come in because the hats uh, are the trigger that allows us to think differently, and that's so. so Rather than jumping straight in with, oh, it's like, hang on a minute, what should I be doing here? And 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 if I can think, oh, actually, this is a great coaching opportunity, or actually, this is clearly a direct opportunity, or you know, it sounds a bit artificial when you explain it that way, but as you practice it, it becomes 
natural. It becomes a habit and, 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 and you build it up fairly quickly. So that was the we that was the thinking behind the core belief. Understand who I am, understand what is it I really value, and then think of use the hats to help me to think about how I demonstrate that rather than just respond emotionally on everything. Yeah, I can understand that, Chris. Like emotions go too high, you're going to rapidly just go to behavior and that behavior might not be the ideal behavior. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Now on, on this topic of really understanding humans, uh, you know, you talk about the core belief system from a leader understanding themselves and also potentially understanding others by getting to that core purpose, core values. Dags, you've got the high performance formula. You've been you know, working on for a fair while and you've brought that into the book. And I, I know from what I've seen, mate, it, it really ties a lot to this context discussion too where, you know, we need to look at the person and we need to think of the context surrounding them. Do you mind taking us through the high performance formula and how it relates to really looking at the person and then considering the context before we choose the hat to put on yeah, or the sure, behavior? Yeah, like it, it, you know, the formula, and it's still evolving, just to, just to put that out there, we will, we will learn continue to learn as, as we as we go through the journey of, of continuous improvements and we will refine the formula as we go but um uh it, it's something i've been working on for quite a number of years and you know the the formula started you know i think i mentioned in the last uh episode there around edgar shine and the quote around creating and managing culture and uh, the first component of, of the the formula is around character um, and you know you want good people on your team. You want people who have your back. You don't want white answers. You know, people who are going to, you know, be passive aggressive and behaviors. And I think there's a great, uh, one of the great leadership books, but one of my favorite leadership books is James Kerr, uh, the legacy that the New Zealand All Blacks Rugby Union team and how they sustained a high level of performance over the number of years. But they have a, they have a wonderful uh, principle and uh, excuse the term, uh, it's called the no dickhead rule, right? So, and I think the, the Sydney Swans also have the same AFL team. Um, they have the same. But what essentially that means, it means is they want good people on their team. They want people of sound character. People are going to have your back. People are not going to backslide or, you know, people are going to, you know, you know, agree with you one minute and then have a water cooler conversation the next minute disagreeing with, with you. So essentially character, you want people of good. Of good character. The next component is behaviors uh, and ideal behaviors, and the book will talk about a lot around you know uh, ideal behaviors that drive um, ideal results. And you know we want people there with ideal behaviors that are going to drive uh, the sustainable results through the organization. The next, the next part of the formula is around vulnerability, and I'll delve a bit more into that this particular. Um, one because it has a profound impact impact on me personally. So, um, and maybe maybe the next episode we'll we'll delve into the final final component of the formula. But vulnerability came about when I was uh, back in two thousand seventeen, I think it was. We were I was going through uh, an organizational off model change, um, and one of my executive coaches at the time he used to say to me, he said, he said, Darb, never ever take a role." because of title or money. Go to where you're most alive and tingling at work, and what if you could replicate that many times over? Go to where you're most alive at work and tingling, and what if you could replicate that many times over? And what he was meaning was, go to where your purpose, go to where you have that inner feeling of fist pumping the air. You know, Brad, when you get that feeling in work that you just overwhelmingly just, yes, I got this. And you get that really warm, fuzzy sensation. That if try and find what that connects you to, um, and what was that actually drove you. So whether that would be things like you know you know solving a problem or or seeing somebody develop through your coaching or using the five hats and you know somebody you know starting to improve, um, whatever that is. But unfortunately, back then, Brad, I didn't listen to him. I didn't take his advice. Uh, and I'm and you know I, there was a role that was a general manager role and. I, I just saw the general manager title um, and I just said, I want to be a general manager and I just didn't pay any heed to what he was saying to me. So anyway, I took, I took the role and it was a, it was a very challenging role. It was, it was a, a new agile type uh, organization where you had tribes and platforms and um, 
you also had a distribution team. So I was the chain, the, the general manager of the, of the chain function that sat in between those, you know, the tribes and platforms and also the distribution. So I was like the, the goalkeeper trying to pass all the, 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 the expedited, you know, pace of change and make, make sure it was rolled out in a succinct, succinct manner for the front line and distribution team to be able to absorb. But over time, I started to really get, um, yeah, at work, I was fine, Brad. I was like, you know, I was like, the, you know, my leadership shadow was, nobody knew any different, but deep down, I was tapping like a duck. I was, I was coming home in the evening time, and I was, you know, I remember just, you know, falling asleep at the top of a half, sitting down, feeling lethargic. My wife was talking to me, and I wasn't listening. It was white noise. My kids, even worse, my kids were talking to me, and they were, you know, a lot younger now, the, you know, mid-teens now, and or late teens, I should say, and they were talking to me and I wasn't I wasn't at home. I wasn't listening. So I was getting out of bed in the morning, having to drag myself out of bed. And I remember uh, going to play golf on Sunday afternoon. It was a beautiful sunny day in Perth. And those of you who know Perth, I was driving along. I live in, in, in North Perth and I was driving towards Cottonwood Golf Club and we drive along by the Indian Ocean with some turquoise blue waters. And those blue waters became very inviting to I almost had this overwhelming feeling of, I just want to end that fire. Um, and I just wanted to drive into that ocean. Now, I managed to get myself to the golf club and I turned the car off and I rang my wife. Um, and I just burst out crying at the time. And I just, we, she, you know, the lovely woman she is, she talked me off my perch and we agreed a plan. The plan was that I was going to play golf and, you know, come back that evening and we would sit and agree a plan to how we were going to approach it in, in, in work the next day. And so we did that and, and the next day was, was a leadership team meeting and, you know, the usual meetings go around the table and or around the, the, the stand up or whatever it was and, you know, how are you feeling and out of 10 and do the usual and got to my turn and I just said, put up my hand and said, team, I'm, I'm drowning. And I explained my scenarios at 84, explained my thoughts, my feelings, my emotions. Um, and I was expecting, I, I, I didn't know what I was expecting, Brad, to be honest with you. And I think what happened next really kind of enlightened me to this part of the formula. And it was almost like, uh, when the minute I put up my hand, it opened that license for all the other general managers to A, speak up, but also they just stopped what they were doing. And the whole meeting, rest of the meeting was around how do we help them solve your issues and make it easier for you, Darren? So we created little systems in place and tripods and, you know, get togethers once a week. So just to get it off our chest. But the more I started to speak about it across the organization of what that scenario and what happened was, the more other general managers and other people started to speak up and say, well, I'm actually feeling the same and I'm having the same quite emotions. Um, but then when I started speaking it to my team, and I, and I when I took over uh, a large contact center, I explained the story to the contact center team, or whatever it was, uh, quite a number of leaders, 28 odd leaders and uh, 34 leaders, I should say, uh, and also a lot of frontline people. It was almost like, it was unbelievable, the, the difference. It was almost like they saw me as a human being and uh, the performance all, all of a sudden lifted. And I was like, whoa, that's not just because of that. And then, you know, it almost gave a safe place, you know, that I was a human being and a safe place to speak up. And they worked harder, not because I asked them to work harder, but it's just because they wanted, they felt connected to me, I suppose. Um, but it helped, it just helped that whole uh, energy. Um, you know, and I think saying that, and I've been spoken to quite a few people about that story and uh, a few people have resonated with it, um, including close friends of mine that are in very high senior positions. So, uh, I continue to promote the vulnerability side. We've got to be vulnerable, uh, and that's the, the, la the third, the, the third component of the formula is that vulnerability. We have to have courage to be vulnerable as leaders, and vulnerability and humility are closely aligned. You can't, I believe, you cannot have one without the other. So yeah, vulnerability is the that component, Brad. And you know, if we can get leaders to be vulnerable, and you know, they don't always have all the answers. Leaders don't have all the answers, but and that's okay. Um, it's how we create the environment for, for the front line to, and again, back to leaders who serve, let them drive the business and the leaders then start to um, support and, and develop their people to, to drive the business forward. Yeah, thank, thanks, Dags. And thanks for sharing that, that story and that tough time in your life, mate. You can see how 
this formulas come together from a real lived experience with yourself mate around character and then ideal behaviors and then the power of vulnerability i know mate that the final part of the formula is interference and i'm guessing you know you were going through a position of interference in a big time then but do you mind i might pass over to chris to just come in on that interference bit like some of the different elements of interference external internal and dogs i'll get you to riff off that too mate if you don't mind sure yeah i mean like look every, everybody Brad, no matter who you are has some sort of you know interference in the lives lives i should say but whether that be intrinsic or extrinsic interference and you know i think i've mentioned briefly in the last episode but you know internal interference or intrinsic interference is such as the things that people grapple with internally is, is you know, lack of self-confidence, lack of self-belief, lack of belief in their own, you know, abilities and capabilities, uh, afraid to speak up, afraid to, you know, speak up in public or, or you know, uh, things that are mental health issues, well-being, um, depression. Um, and, and in my case back then, my internal interference was, was exactly as I was going through that spiral of self-doubt and self, um, you know, didn't believe that I had the right capabilities to be a general manager um, and you know and then you have the the external interference or the extrinsic interference which is things externally that are driven uh driving the individual's behavior uh, that could be things like you know bullying workplace bullying financial abuse domestic abuse um, and in my case at the time i had a my extrinsic interference and you know i look i look back in it now and laugh about it but you know i had a 16 year old teenage son who was who was being very challenging for myself and my wife at the time and those are those of you who have 16 year olds or 15 year old teenagers you know it does can put a lot of pressure on, on a marriage and you know we yeah. were we were, were going through a tough time with, with him he's come out of it now he's a great kid and he's come out of it as we always do but that was my external extrinsic interference at the time but everybody has some form of internal or external uh, extrinsic interference so uh, you know I think we, I also mentioned earlier on around the last episode around Ed, Ed, Edward Jemming never blame people blame process because 95% of the time people come to work each day to do a good job. So if they make a, make an error or the behavior is not there, generally there's something going on, whether that be intrinsic or extrinsic interference. They could be, you know, their, their, their boss or somebody around them has just put immense pressure on them to do something and work. And, that cause that behavior. So we just need to reflect as a leader and stand back and go, right, what is going on in this uh, in this scenario here? Is it intrinsic or extrinsic interference? And if it's intrinsic interference, it might take a bit longer for for the leader to, to un- under- un- uncover what that actually is. And I, there's a great case study story in the book around how one of my previous leaders uh, did this um, uncovering of intrinsic interference. Um, I won't go into it now, but you know, it's one that it's a it's a great case study, and it's something that leaders can definitely learn from. Yeah, uh, I think it's a good anticipation for people. It was a great story that I got to see, and I I love that one too. So, thanks, thanks, Doug. Um, it's such a cool, great formula. And for me, when you look at what you've written about with being an adaptive leader who looks at the person and thinks about the context surrounding them, that high performance formula is just such a great extension on that and so much more. So thanks dogs for sharing, mate. Chris, in, in the book, you write about really leading from the front in a chapter and the concept of look, listen, learn walks that I love the language. Do you, do you mind explaining listeners why you dedicated a chapter to that piece? And then the concept of look, listen, learn walks. Sure, sure, and, and and actually, I just build on on what Dark said because actually, look, listen, and what learn is key to understanding interferences. Yeah? This is one of the you know we we have to be prepared to to really listen, otherwise we're never going to pick up those interferences. Mm. So one of the one of the things that struck me a few years ago was um, lots of talk everywhere in, in continuous improvement and leaders about doing Gamba. And I almost become the fashionable thing to do. I've got to do Gemba, and I've got to do so many uh, a week of these Gemba activities. And uh, we end up sending people out with targets to do go and go and do ten of these and tick the box. And and um, I realised in many cases it's just missing the point. Um, to you know, be a bit provocative, but they. Um, so I, I was actually teaching 
uh, a class in New Zealand, and we were talking about this, and and we were uh, doing look look and look and listen. I, I was calling them at the time, but uh, go and look and listen. And there was a Maori elder in the class, and uh, he said uh, to me, he said, "Oh, what you're really saying is we need to look, listen, and then learn about what we've heard." And I thought, "Yeah, we do. Yeah. That's brilliant." So I stole it, and uh, and I, with his permission. Uh, and and I, and I said that you know because actually that gives it a clear purpose. Um, we've actually got to we're doing this to learn. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to look, uh, and I, it's not just walks. You know, we call it walks, but it, it's just going talking to someone and look, listen, and learn. You know, it, it, uh, it's like the look, listen, learn activities. Um, I'm going to look. I'm going to listen to what people are saying. I'm going to listen to what's happening. And then I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn not from the perspective of what have they got to do better, but from the perspective of what have I got to do better. I want to give you an example. There's, you know, a classic uh, activity might be I'm going to go and uh, see if people understand the purpose of the organization. I might just ask them, you know, what are, what are, what are the goals, how are you achieving them? Now, uh, one way you could look at that is I'm going to I'm, – doing that and I'm testing them, you know, and that's often how it will come across. But what we should be doing with look, listen, learn is I'm really learning. The reason I'm asking those questions is I want to learn is the way that we've done that and the system we've used, has it been effective? So I'm learning about uh, how well what I've done has worked. And so I, if they can't tell me, what the purpose is and how they connect to the calls, that's not their fault. That tells me I've not done it well enough and there's potentially an issue with the system and I now need to decide which hat I'm going to use to help them to understand it and go back and learn about what we need to change to make it better. Um, so so it, it links very strongly into humility. I don't think you can do a good look, listen, learn activity without a humility hat on and i also fully agree with dogs is you've got to be a little bit vulnerable to open to fact actually i probably messed that up you know mm. <laughs> i didn't do it very well and that's why they don't understand it so that is that is the key to look listen learn what have i learned what am i learning about what i'm seeing and what am i learning about myself mm. i love too chris how you you connected that look listen learn activity to then the adaptive leader, you know, using that learning to go, okay, how do, how do I best show up here? Which hat, what approach do I take to help that person grow and help it, the system work? Brilliant. Dags, in, in another part of the book, you write about really, I think you call it nurturing the, nurturing the trees and growing talent through your organization. Like why is it so important in leading excellence that we really consider growing talent and capability within the organization, particularly from a leadership sense? Well, from, for me, Chris, or, or Brad, and, and, and as you know, Chris, and the three of us have spoken quite a lot around leadership development and developing people. Uh, you know, as, as I think I said before, they're the only asset that has the capacity to appreciate and value in the organization. So how do we actually start to develop and create people with the right mindsets and behaviors and um, character through the organization, you know, so you know when you see when you see really strong development systems in place, um, and you're developing your talent through the organization, you know the example I gave is was a contact center. You know, and, and generally contact centers rather are the entry level roles in most organizations, and they're, they're sort of, you know sometimes seen as a second class citizens, and so to speak, in the organization they they but yet they they speak to probably the most number of customers every single day. Um, so how do you got to start to create a really strong culture of development? And, and you know, how do you develop people through that system of, of the entry level role right through the organization? We see this in mining, you know, where we don't have, you know, hard, we have hard to fill roles um, across different crews and maintenance crews and production crews because we're not identifying talent on the entry level and have really strong development pathways. So when you, so in the book, we talk a lot around how developing those pathways for individuals as well as developing leaders, because if you can develop leaders with these five hats in mind, 
and have the capabilities, you know, to go and understand people's intrinsic and extrinsic interference and create a culture of high performance and psychologically safe place to speak up. Overall, you the whole organization will shift. Now that takes time, Brad. It'll take you know many years for you to develop that talent pool of of of, of leadership coming through. Um, but there's a there's a there's a handy tool in the book, the leadership talent matrix, which is a is a really cool routine that you know, meeting or routine, whatever you want to call it, that you could do each quarter with your leadership team to really try and identify those up and coming leaders and how do you develop with the right skills and attributes and character and behaviors to your organization. Um again, that's you know, that's the humility piece around the leaders. You you know, you're going to be potentially creating leaders that are going to be ten times better than you will ever be. Um, but to me that's that's uh, my purpose, right? And that's connect, connect. Uh, I think that's Chris's purpose as well. Uh, you, the overall organization and the customers uh, and shareholders will benefit overall. It's it's massive, and I I got to admit, Doug, I I see so many organizations where they'll have hundreds of employees, but they keep hiring leadership from external, and you sort of mm. think, surely in that hundreds and hundreds of employees, there's some leadership talent potential in there to grow. I don't know if if yeah. you see the same, but it's un un unbelievable. It just yeah, can't and, be. Uh, absolutely. And that's where this talent matrix will really help you as an individual or a leader. Is how do you really start to identify those potentials and bring them through the matrix and bring them through the maturity um, of being a leader with, with the right skill, skills and, and capabilities and behaviors, um, you know, that we, we speak about in the book. Yeah. Well, I love guys written a book that is core to really, I guess, creating a cultural continuous for improvement and innovation. And I love the topics that you've covered. I know there's so many case stories and great examples in there that people can read about and learn from apart from the ones that have covered today. Chris, just for yourself, mate, for a leader, of course, would recommend a leader to get the book, but what would be your enterprise excellence or leading excellence two minute tip around this concept of leading excellence and the adaptive leader, the five hats for the adaptive leader? Um, really to think about people as people. Think about um, how do I help to create an environment where people can thrive and what my how much a phrase we haven't mentioned so far in the podcast, but we use it a lot in the book, is, is the leadership shadow. Mm. So really think about what's the shadow I'm casting and is that a shadow, a shadow that I'm proud of? Yeah, too true. Too true. Thanks, Chris. And Doug, the question I got for you, mate, like I know that you've been through, all been through a massive exploration of data and knowledge and research to be able to develop this book. But what's been the biggest insight for you through the whole journey of, you know, really developing this book, Leading Excellence, The Five Hats of the Adaptive Leader? Oh, for Brad, for me, like leadership is, is a privilege, right? It's it's probably one of the most reward. If, you know, if you're a, a leader that is vulnerable and, you know, leads with humility and, um, you know, has the five hats, you know, that they use day in, day out, it is incredibly rewarding as a leader because you have the profound ability to impact the lives of not just your employees, Brad, but your employees' partners and kids and uncles and aunties because your shadow, as Chris mentioned, casts a very wide net. Um, so you, and I think Chris mentioned it in the last episode around the, the percentages of, of engagement from your leader is equal to that of your partner. So you know, you, you 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 have an immense ability to impact positively the lives of hundreds, if not thousands of people. And that to me is the most rewarding thing that that yeah, it's it's one that I'm very proud of. And and I think if you're a leader and you can think that way, you can go on to to, you know, do great things and help lots of people in their careers and their families and what have you. So it goes beyond the staff leader. If that yeah. makes sense. Thanks, Doug. It's truly creating that better future. And, yeah. and Chris, how can people get hold of the book or connect to gain more information about the book or other content? We've got a website, uh, leadingexcellencebook.com. 
a great great uh, source for resources. Um, you can you can buy the book through links on there. You can you can order it direct from ourselves if you want large quantities. Um, and we're also building a, a portfolio. We we had so many case studies. The book has already got like thirty case studies in it, and and we couldn't put everything in there. Uh, uh, and um, so what we're going to do is have extended versions on the website, so so people can access those as well. Um, and the book will, is also going to be available on from BookPod to order online and and from Amazon, and there will be an ebook uh, as well. All of that should be out in August. Nice. Well, Chris and Dags, mate, thanks for all your efforts and everything you've done to share knowledge in the show, but also through the book. And thanks for helping us create a better future, guys, and living your purpose. Appreciate it. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, bro. Cheers, guys. Bye from now. What a great episode. It's so good to be able to chat to my good friends, Chris Butterworth and Stephen Dargan, on this book we put so much effort into. And we really know will revolutionize organizations' approach to transformation and truly creating that better future. Remember, you can go to the website leadingexcellencebook.com to get hold of additional resources, also look at events coming up, and also get links to purchase the book, some good pricing. There were two key takeaways for me from this episode. Firstly, the high performance formula. You know, Stephen Dargan has done such an amazing job leaning into that formula and really looking at how do we create high performance in organization through the way that we show up and look after ourselves as leaders also. The other key takeaway for me was the power of the look, listen, learn walk. You know, really getting out to the workplace, looking, listening, asking great questions and listening, and then learning from these interactions to then think, right, what behavior or even uh, belief can I lean in on to truly help create better outcomes and serve these that I'm seeing to help them grow? And that could be as a senior leader that our focus is to actually go and coach and support leaders below us to then cascade a better leadership shadow or an improved leadership shadow down to the front line. What a great episode. It was so great being able to record this with the two guys. Really appreciate all the effort, guys, over the last two years, and it's such a great thing to have this book out now. Thanks again, listeners. Bye for now.